Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. Today's video is going to be another hat tutorial, but this time we are going a little bit bigger and bolder and making a beautiful Edwardian hat. Kind of like the one that I'm wearing. Or like this. Or like this. Or like this one. But mostly like this, since it's the hat that will be featured in today's tutorial. I've been getting requests to make a tutorial like this for literal years, but I didn't want to make one until I had a few other foundational hat tutorials already on my channel. Like my pillbox hat tutorial, which if you haven't seen already, I would really suggest watching before this one. It introduces you to a lot of the same techniques I'll be using today, but in a much less intimidating manner. Hat making is also one of those things that's kind of sacred to me, since it's one of the few things I can do in front of the TV on my own time. So I've never wanted to film the process from start to finish, but after I completed the first project in my Sewing Through Decades project, project and a very dramatic hat to go with it, specifically this one, it seemed like a good time to show you guys how to make one of your own. So that is what I'm doing today, and on that note, let's get into the video and I hope you enjoy. So as always, the material list for this project is a bit intimidating, but I promise the project itself isn't that hard. For this project, you will need paper to draft the pattern on. You'll also need a pencil, pen, or marker, and scissors. A ruler is required as well, and if you happen to have a soft measuring tape, that's great too. For the hat base, you'll need heavy felt weight interfacing like the one shown here. You could also use a heavyweight buckram or a mixture of the two. I'll leave links to both in the description box down below. To reinforce the hat, you'll need wire of some sort. I'm using 18 gauge picture hanging wire, which I got from a hardware store. You'll also want something capable of cutting the wire, like tin snips, along with pliers and binder clips. Having a fabric to cover the base with is important too, and you'll want lining for the crown and brim. The quantity and types of fabric depend on the size and look of the hat you want, but I'll talk more about that later on. You'll see me using sewing scissors throughout this video, along with pins, thread, and needles. A sewing machine makes this process faster, but isn't necessary. On to the fun stuff. Decorations. I'd recommend having some sort of contrasting fabric or ribbon to use as a band for the hat. Along with an assortment of feathers, ostrich drafts are the most fun, but any type works, and artificial flowers or other decorations. I'd recommend picking a variety of sizes, colors, and textures to get the most realistic effect. And make sure to keep the leaves that come with the flowers, because we can use those too. And with the raw material sorted, let's get to drafting. I'm going to make the top of the hat first. This is an oval shape, and to make the drafting easier, I'm going to fold my paper in half, then in half again. This way I only have to draft one quarter of it. Now measure away from the corner with a ruler, using the halved dimensions you want the hat to have. Typically these were slightly wider side to side, but the actual size of it, and the shape, is totally up to you. Hats that sat on top of the head were popular during the early 1900s, as were hats with huge crowns that covered the entire head and then some. Connect the markings with a curved line, then cut across the line. Unfold the paper, and voila! A pattern! Except I thought mine was too small, so I made some changes and recut it. Once you have a pattern you are happy with, fold it in half and trace around the curved edge onto a larger piece of paper. And you want to fold it in half so you are tracing the half that will go side to side on the head. Use a ruler to mark a straight line across the fold point, and extend this line beyond the ends of the pattern. This will be a guide for creating the brim. Now use a ruler to measure away from the top pattern and mark the brim design. Again, the dimensions are totally down to personal preferences. I've seen hats with 8 inch wide brims and hats with 2 inch wide brims, and I've made pretty much everything in between. You can also make the brim narrower towards the center, which I did, or even asymmetric if you want. And here I'm marking the center line since I forgot to do that earlier. Something I would recommend is not cutting the brim as a single flat piece that sticks straight out. These are hard to keep straight and can be finicky to wear because of that. Instead, taper the side edges of the brim by a half inch or so, towards the outer edge of the brim. This will cause it to slope down, which makes it hold its shape way better, and makes the design more interesting in general. I made some last minute adjustments then folded the paper in half along the center line and cut across the brim design I just drew out. Also, make sure to trim a tenth of an inch or so off the inner portion of the brim. This is to allow for the bulk of the interfacing that will make up the crown. If you're using buckram, you can skip this step or trim off much less since it is a thinner material. Now make sure the brim pattern lines up well with the top of the hat. It should, but it's always good to double check. 
Using a ruler or soft measuring tape, if you have one, measure the circumference of the top pattern. You actually only have to measure one quarter of it, then multiply that measurement by four. I'd also suggest adding an inch or two to this measurement for safety. This measurement is for the length of the crown of the hat, which is a rectangle that gives the hat height and will connect the brim and the top pieces. Speaking of height, you'll want to decide how high to make the crown. Again, this ranges so much depending on what look you are going for. Anything from one inches to eight inches is acceptable. Write those measurements down onto one of the other pattern pieces. Now the pattern can be cut out. Interfacing and buckram are both tricky to get straight pins through, so pattern weights or tacks work better for this process. Once the pattern pieces are positioned, trace around them with a pen or marker. Now the pieces can be cut out, and try to cut on the inner edge of the line you drew since that will likely be the most accurate. While I'm cutting away, I just want to mention that I actually think buckram is a better choice for this project. It's much thinner and lighter, which gives a more professional looking appearance to the edge, and it makes it a bit more comfortable to wear. Though I still prefer the interfacing for the crown and top, definitely opt for a buckram brim if you have access to it. I just forgot to order some prior to filming this, so interfacing it is for me. <laughs> Since the brim was cut out as two pieces to create the slanted sides, the ends need to be sewn together. Instead of stitching this as a normal seam, I'm using a wide zigzag stitch to secure the pieces together. I'll refer to this join point as the side seam later on, even though it's top stitched together. To make sure the brim holds its shape, I'll be adding three bands of wire, one to either edge and one around the midpoint of the brim. Here you can see me drawing a line approximately where the middle band will go. Also, it's worth noting that depending on the width of the brim, you might not need this middle band at all, or you might need multiple bands. It just kind of depends on how sturdy you want the brim to be. As I said earlier, I'll be using 18 gauge galvanized steel wire for this project. Most hardware stores should have this, and it's very inexpensive. You'll want to cut a length of wire slightly larger than the circumference of the brim of the hat. <laughs> then use pliers to create a flat loop on one end. Secure this loop to the back of the lower edge of the brim using small binder clips. Then continue bending and securing the wire all the way around the brim. If you want to bind the edges of your hat with bias binding like I'll be doing in this tutorial, then the wire needs to be very close to the edge of the interfacing so you don't hit it when you're sewing the binding on. If you're finishing the edge by turning the top layer of the brim fabric inward, then the wire can be further out and less precise. Once you reach the end, trim off the excess wire but leave enough so the ends can overlap by 2 or 3 inches, otherwise there will be a weak point where the ends meet. Then form another small loop and secure it with more binder clips. Repeat these steps on the top edge of the brim, and try to keep the wire start and end points parallel to the start and end point of the first band of wire. Also repeat this on the top of the hat, once again start and end the wire at what will become the back of the hat. <laughs> now the wire can be sewn on using a wide zigzag stitch and medium stitch length. If the stitch length is too narrow, it can perforate the interfacing or buckram, which isn't what you want at all. Sew very slowly and remove binder clips as you go. As long as you keep the center of the sewing machine foot centered with the wire and the stitch width is wide enough, the needle should pass right over it and flawlessly encase the wire in zigzagged thread. However, I would suggest skipping over the start and end point and sewing those down later on by hand. Speaking of by hand, you can whip stitch the wire into the hat if you don't have a sewing machine. The process is slow but totally doable. Trust me, I made many of my hats that way. You might notice that the middle band of wire can't be pinned or clipped into position since it's so far from the edges. So after cutting a piece of wire that was long enough and looping the end, I began carefully stitching it on. I'm guiding the wire so it stays centered on the foot as I sew, and I'm doing my best to follow the line I marked earlier, though this doesn't have to be perfect by any means. Here I'm clipping the excess wire from the middle band and making another loop. These loops secure the wire so it doesn't unravel and end up bulging outside of the thread channel created for it. I like sewing them down by hand using whip stitches, and this is done for every loop on every piece. Speaking of pieces, I forgot about the crown's existence. Here I'm marking the measurements I wrote down earlier onto the interfacing and cutting out a band which will connect the brim and the top piece. Since the crown is just a rectangle, I find it easier to mark the dimensions out onto the interfacing rather than create a paper pattern for it. Though if you make a paper pattern, maybe you won't forget that the piece exists. Then I'm repeating all the steps I showed earlier with the wire, and I'm starting the wire at one of the narrow ends which will be positioned at the back and less noticeable. 
The reason I keep mentioning starting the wire at the back of the hat is because the start and end points are bulkier and stiffer than the rest of the wire in the hat. It can cause the sections to look bulkier under the fabric or act differently when bent, so it's just best to hide those where people are less likely to see them. Now with all the pieces reinforced with wire, we can begin to cover them. I decided to do a gathered interior lining for the brim, which meant I had to figure out the circumference and depth of the brim. I cut strips of fabric to be the exact depth of the brim and twice the outer circumference. Unfortunately, the brim lining I wanted to use was a little sheer and the wire showed through it. So to get around that, I cut out strips of muslin to line the lining with. That's counterintuitive. <laughs> And I had to cut out several strips and sew them together to get something long enough to match the doubled brim circumference measurement. I laid the lining on top of the muslin and gathered them down together by machine. This is my fast and rough way of gathering, which is done by pushing the fabric under the foot with your finger. But you could also use a gathering foot, or gather it down by hand using running stitches, or any other method that you prefer. Now the lining can be stitched to the brim. I like starting at the top, and I'm using really large whip stitches to secure this. They are basically basting stitches since this will be secured more thoroughly later on. Once you reach the end, trim off any unnecessary length and fold the raw edge inward. Before securing the other edge of the lining, make sure your hat is oriented like it will be on your head, with the side sloping down. Now use more loose whip stitches to secure the other edge, and make sure to pull the fabric slightly as you do this since you don't want the lining to look baggy. Now the top layers of fabric can be cut. Roughly cut around the edges of the pieces with an inch or two of excess on each side. The fabric I picked for this is a medium weight wool garberdine, and though I like the color, this was too thick of a fabric to be ideal. Things like cotton sateen, shanting, taffeta, satin, or anything similar will look just as nice, if not nicer, without making the edges of the brim look as bulky. I secured the top layer fabric to the top piece of the hat using a lot of thread, and I moved in a crisscross pattern until there is an even amount of tension across the entire edge. Or edges. It's a circle, so I'm not sure what the exact definition is. <laughs> then I lined the piece with cotton, which was cut to be an inch larger than the hat piece. The edges were all tucked inward and pinned down. This part of the hat won't be seen, so you can use whatever lining fabric you like, or none at all. The lining has no structural impact on this piece, it just makes it look nicer. The lining for this piece was sewn into position with slip stitches. And I must say, I'm regretting going for muslin for this one, I should have used something more fun. <laughs> Maybe the scraps from my orange monkey fabric or something ridiculous like that. <laughs> I was going to line the crown the same way, but I realized I cut the top layer fabric wide enough that I could fold the edges over each other on the interior of the piece, as you see me doing here. It isn't particularly even since I didn't intend to use this method, but it did the job and saved me some time and fabric. <laughs> This was supposed to be sewn with slip stitches, but I didn't do a very good job, so they are more like whip stitches if I'm being honest. <laughs> For the brim, I laid the fabric over top and used pins to smooth it out and make sure it was laying nicely. Then I trimmed off the excess fabric from the bottom edge. Please note that if you want to finish this edge without bias binding, do not cut off the excess. It is going to be very important. Since I will be using bias binding to nicely finish this, I could just go ahead and whip stitch all the way around the edge. If you aren't using bias binding for this edge, then evenly trim the excess material hanging over the edge to around three quarters of an inch. Fold the raw edge inward by a quarter inch, then inward by a half inch, and pin it to the interior of the brim. Slip stitch the folded edge down for a really nice looking finish. Alternatively, trim the excess down to a half inch, fold it inward, and whip stitch it to the lining. Then you can cover the raw edge with a ruffle or lace or flat bias strips. The only problem with those methods is that easing the fabric around the interior of the brim can be difficult, but it does avoid visible seam lines on the exterior, so it's really up to you. Now cut out the opening in the brim and leave around three quarters of an inch of excess. Notch the excess material about a half inch deep. Then fold the excess inward twice to hide the raw edge. Pin this to the lining and repeat all the way around the inner portion of the brim. If you're working with a really stiff fabric like taffeta, 
or taffeta, then you may not be able to ease the edge inward like this. In that case, you can trim the excess down to a quarter inch, notch it, then fold it inward once and whip stitch it to the lining. Then cover the raw edge with ribbon, ruffles, bias binding, etc. This is also basically what you can do on the outer brim to avoid bias binding. In addition to working with stiff fabrics, this is also a good option for really fray prone fabrics that might disintegrate under the weight of the stitches over time. Once it was nicely pinned, I sewed the folded edge down, and this is the stitching that really secures the inner edge of the lining. That's why I said the large whip stitches early on were effectively basting stitches. Now the last stitch to finish is the brim, and I'm doing this with bias binding, as I've made very clear throughout this video. To do that, cut strips of material on the fabric's bias, which are long enough to cover the outer edge of the brim. And if you want to, you can use contrasting fabric for this. Evenly pin the strip to the right side of the brim with the edges aligned. And mentally prepare yourself for sewing it on, as there are some risks of hitting the wire and breaking a needle. So you might want to wear eye protection just in case it flies up and tries to hit you in your face. These ones are from Google. They send you them with the silver play button. That is a complete lie. I think my dad got these from Maker Fair. <laughs> Can you imagine getting a box and it's just like this framed silver play button and a set of bright yellow safety glasses? Also, I would recommend using a zipper foot for this so you can get the needle closer to the wire without the foot interfering. Now stitch very slowly a half inch away from the outer edge of the brim. Assuming the wire was placed less than a half inch from the edge, you shouldn't have any problems, but please go slowly and be prepared for a needle to break. Here you can see the interior of the brim. There's a solid line of stitching a half inch away from the edge. This will be our guide for the next step. Pull the binding taut and fold it inward so the raw edge is tucked away. The folded edge should align with the stitch line. Continue this process all the way around the hat. Also check from the outside of the hat every so often to make sure it looks even from the other side. You won't see a whole lot of the interior, so if it isn't perfect, that's okay, but try your best, especially on the exterior. I'm sewing this down with tiny whip stitches, and I didn't film a lot of the process because it took a really long time. But here is a close-up of the finished stitching, and you can also see how bulky the edge itself is. As I said earlier, I'd recommend using a thinner fabric and a thinner base like buckram to avoid this. Now all the pieces are done, they just have to be sewn together. The first step in doing this is forming the crown into a crown-like shape. I mentioned at the beginning to add an inch or two of ease to the crown's length. And this is when that's going to come in handy, because it allows you to overlap the ends. I had about an inch of ease, so I marked a line one inch away from one end, then pinned the other end so it aligned with that line. There are lots of lines. I sewed the pieces together at this point using heavy duty thread. It's very easy to break normal thread during this process. Since the hat doesn't have much give, you don't have to worry about puckering like you do with fabric. So it's easy to use too much force without realizing it until the thread breaks. Once the crown is sewn together, push the top of the hat into the crown until the surface is level with the sides of the crown. Also try to align the back of the top piece with the back edge of the crown. It doesn't have to be perfect, but close-ish is good enough in this case. Now I'm using... I don't know what you would call this stitch. It's like a slip stitch, sort of, to attach the top of the hat to the crown. The stitches should be hidden, but they go through multiple layers, so they are very secure. When doing this, I like to start from the side and work towards the front, then go from the other side to the back. This gives you a chance to ease the pieces together in case your measurements were slightly off. Now use your pattern to mark the side points of the top of the hat, and use a ruler and pins to mark this down the sides of the crown. Feel for the side seams in the brim or use your pattern to find them, and mark these with pins as well. Line the pins on the side of the crown up with these side markings on the brim. Make sure these line up, otherwise the hat could be asymmetrical. Also remember that the back of the crown should be somewhat aligned with the back of the brim where the wire began and ended. And now you can sew them together. This part isn't visible when the hat is worn at all, so any sturdy stitch is fine to secure these together. Just make sure you are stitching through the base layers in addition to the fabric. Now you officially have a hat base. And you may try this on and think, oh god, it looks awful, why did I waste so much time? But fear not, that is the case with most ridiculous historical hats. 
They just don't naturally flatter the face the way fascinators and bonnets do. The smaller crowned Edwardian hats look silly without styled hair, and the big ones look silly since they are so oversized. Styling trims are a big part of making them look intentional and good on the head. And it just so happens that trimming the hat is the most fun part, at least for me. I like to start by making a sash. You can use ribbon or bias cut strips of fabric sewed into tubes and turn the right way out, like I'm doing here. I picked an ivory silk shanting for this part, which serves as a base for the various flowers I'm going to add and complements the lining of the hat really nicely. I'm arranging this around the hat, then knotting it in place. I like to sew or tie all fabric elements down since they don't glue particularly well. However, flowers and feathers I glue down since I find that creates a more solid bond than sewing, especially when you're working with a polyester top layer fabric since that will melt and bond to the flowers. When you're using a base like wool, like I'm using, things will be a little bit less secure just in general. I like to start the decorating process by arranging flowers on one side of the hat. I find once I glue on something, even if it's small, that gives me the confidence to move forward. Today I'm mostly using flowers I got from the craft store to decorate this hat. These obviously didn't exist 100 years ago. Handmade silk flowers would have been the norm, but those are very time consuming to make and much more expensive. I feel like the craft store flowers give me a really pretty result at a fraction of the price. I'm also open to using other things to decorate hats, like birds and plastic fruits. The early 1900s were such a ridiculous time for accessories and you can find drawings or pictures of just about anything piled on people's heads. So maybe go a little crazy with what you choose to trim the hat with. It might not be historically accurate, but it's probably accurate to the mindset people had when making fluffy ridiculous Edwardian creations, and I feel like that's important too. My main tip for this process is picking a variety of textures for your decorations. If you want to use flowers, buy ones in slightly different colors and sizes. The variation will make them look more interesting. Also go for flowers with a gradient effect on the leaves or contrasting centers. I find these tend to look more realistic as well. And don't be afraid to use the leaves. They can help break up a dense floral design and add a lot to the design in general. It's also important to try the hat on often during this process just to make sure the placement flatters you and your vision. When it comes to feathers, I like ostrich drabs, but these feathers can be huge and really difficult to place on a hat. So I find cutting them into smaller one or three inch sections and tucking them between the flowers and behind the band adds a ton of texture and movement without stealing the focus from other elements. After everything has dried and been sewn on, make sure to remove lint and glue strings. And now your hat is done and ready to be worn and enjoyed. And remember, the hat in this video is just an example of these techniques. You could use these techniques to create a larger brim hat with a smaller crown, or a smaller hat in general, or a larger hat in general, or a completely differently shaped 18th century hat. Make one with no feathers. Make one with 50 feathers. My hat is just an example. So please let your imagination soar when making these, just like the feathers in your hat do in the breeze. That sounded more poetic in my head. And that finishes off my hat tutorial. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video and learned something new or interesting or just enjoyed seeing it come together. Uh, this is one of my favorite hats I've made in a while, though so I think I prefer the original one that inspired it because it has grapes on it, and it's very difficult to beat a hat that has grapes on it. <laughs> I want to clarify what I said about the brim being too thick. Though I've been quite open about my hatred for buckram in previous videos, I do feel like buckram is the best material for doing wide brim hats like this one. It's way lighter, which makes the hat much more comfortable to wear long term, and it also means you can get a much thinner edge. The edge on this hat is quite bulky, partially because I used the interfacing and also because I used a thicker suiting to bind it. If this was bound in silk or lighter fabric, it wouldn't look nearly as clunky, but it will never look as thin as a buckram based hat. So I don't know if you can see the edge difference there, but this one is significantly thinner, it's significantly lighter, and when you're using buckram for larger pieces, it's a lot less finicky, and as long as you add enough wire, it does seem to hold its shape pretty well. So though I don't like using buckram for smaller pieces, for brims of hats like this one, it's definitely the way to go if you can get your hands on it. But it can be difficult to find and difficult to order since you won't necessarily know what thickness you're getting, and you do want a pretty thick, firm buckram for doing the brims of hats. So that is just something that I wanted to clarify. I also want to mention how you can make these hats more comfortable and keep them perfectly perched on your head. So right now I have this hat kind of tipped back, so even though it's very large and there's quite a bit of room here, it's sitting relatively nicely. However, this could tip forward, and that looks significantly less glamorous. 
At least I think it does. The top of my head is also bumping across the top of the interfacing, which isn't the most comfortable thing in the world. So when you're making really huge hats like this, something you can do is safety pin a pad in there. So for example, in this one, I have safety pinned a sock that is stuffed with another sock. And that means that the hat doesn't dip down as far on my head. So I just position this kind of at the back. And then it prevents the hat from slipping down too far. And it makes it more comfortable since now the top of my head is hitting the sock as opposed to the top of the interfacing. So that's a nice little hack if you want to wear one of these hats for a long period of time and you're worried about it getting uncomfortable or slipping out of position. And that is everything that I have to say, I think, for this one. I'll be back next week with another new video, so keep an eye out for that and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, leaving a comment or like really helps me out with YouTube's weird algorithm that no one understands. So that would be appreciated too. <laughs> Thanks again for watching and I shall talk to you all of you very soon. My hair is having a moment. <laughs>